Hello everyone, my name is Phil Winder and I run a business called Winder.ai and we are AI consultants. We do development and, um, uh, and consulting in the fields of uh, machine learning, of reinforcement learning and DemoLops as well. So it's the application and the operation of those AI applications. Um, I'm also the author of O'Reilly's Reinforcement Learning, so uh, I know quite a lot of bit, uh, quite a lot about that. Um, but today we're going to be talking a lot more about data engineering. Um, so I'm here with my colleague Enrico, and Enrico's done a load of really cool work investigating the, the ecosystem um, surrounding the general purpose compute. And, and, and whereas if you come from the Hadoop, well, you, you might want to plug your ears in or something because there's going to be a bit of Hadoop bashing in this presentation. Um, and Okay, so in terms of the, the, the outline, I'm going to start digging into just some high-level concepts about what, what data science is and specifically the life cycle of data engineering um, because it, it is relevant to this project and it is relevant to what Enrico is going to say, but you do need a little bit of background information in order to understand it. Then Enrico is going to jump into a load of examples of how you do this in various frameworks um, and he'll, he'll sort of talk about the, the, the choice of frameworks that he's, he's chosen to analyze a little bit later. But then he's going to talk about the pain and specifically we're, we're going to try and highlight the fact if, if, if you wanted to just get the 10 second version of this presentation and the, the main reason why we're so inter interested in this project is that most data engineering and most data science tooling is rubbish. It's really not very nice to use. It's really hard to use. So if, if we have an opportunity to build something that is nice to use, that's, that's going to be great. Um, then I'm going to try and sort of map those solutions back to the, 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 the portfolio that I've, I've presented a little bit earlier and, and try and pull out some sort of key themes and ideas that I think Backlow or, or the subsequent version of Backlow needs to um, adhere to. Okay, so, so to begin with, I, I, I wanted to try and describe um, what data science is and the, the workflow and the life cycle, but specifically like where the pain points emerge in this life cycle. I, there's a number of dimensions that you could use to try and describe this. I, I chose these two. Um, I can't quite see the arrows that are going at the top there, but it doesn't really matter. Basically, we've got two axes here. On the, on the y-axis up and down, we've got the traditional data science life cycle. So this is the thing that's taught in most data science courses. Um, this is how you go from having some data to a serving usable product at the end. And we'll go through those phases in, the, in, the, in a little bit. On the other axis, I've, I've called it AI maturity, but really it's just a normal engineering project maturity. You've got different phases in the development of your, your application that starts off with trying to prove the viability of something, and you go through various different stages. Again, you may have more or less of these stages and phases, but eventually you're trying to get to production. That's the, the ultimate aim. Um, one of the biggest things to, or the, one of the hardest things to describe to non-data scientists about this process is that jump from proof of concept to MDP, or that jump from MDP to production. It's that, 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 there should be like a massive gulf, a big trench in between those two things, and you've got to try and span that, that trench because you know, it's, 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 a bit like, it's a bit like with the projector today. You know, all you want to do is just plug that cable in and you want the projector to work. But the projector gods are just saying, no, no, your laptop's not good enough. It's not going to work. And it's, it's, it's the same in data science. You know, you've got your code. You've got this pandas code that looks really simple and really nice and it's pre-processing your data. I just want to put it out there on the internet or I want to put it out there on a cluster or something. And, and you've got to go through a complete translation process in order to do that and it's really horrible. Um, so, yeah, on, on the left-hand side, we've got data, working with the data. We've got feature engineering, so that's working with raw data and turning it into something that's useful in the model itself. Um, important sort of data engineering step. Then we've got modeling, which is principally the role of a data scientist, and they're responsible for investigating and analyzing and deciding upon which algorithm and which implementation that they're, they're going to use to... Um, to, to build this model, uh, you go through some training process, the evaluation is trying to figure out how well you're doing, and then the deployment. And so, so this is like the, the traditional data science process. And when you mix that with the, the AI maturity, <coughs> you effectively get this pattern where when you're doing a POC, you're just trying to prove whether the whole idea is viable. And so you want to try and fail fast, you don't want to spend much time or money, so it's all local, completely local. 
Okay, so you're working on your laptop, you're working in notebooks, you're working with local data, it's all local. You're just trying to prove that it's, it's, it's even possible. When you make that jump to get to try and get something in front of a user, then you have a whole load of rework that needs to try and make these things more uh, scripted, more declarative, more definitive, basically, so that a larger system can take over and run it. Finally, you, you get into prod and you've got to be reactive. So there's, there's three, three sort of key phases there. And the other important dimension to get into this picture is that this isn't data science. Data science used to be like, the, when, when, you, when you, in the past, when you said you were a data scientist, you did all of this. But in fact, that doesn't happen anymore. In most, you know, most companies where there's more than one data scientist, this, this role has been split out into specific subdomains. It's been split out into data engineers, into ML engineers, into DevOps, obviously, into MLOps platform engineers, and so on and so forth. And so there's actually a real mix of people all working on this one so-called data science project. It's not just the data scientist. And I think when we're talking in the context of Bacalao as it currently stands, we're not actually talking about data science at all. We're talking about data engineering. We're talking about we've, we have the data in place. We need to do and operate upon that data to produce other data. And that's, that is exactly the, the, the job description of a, a data engineer. So if I start focusing a bit more now on the, the, the specific role of a data engineer, then again, they have very different needs and very different uh, tasks that they need to achieve at different points in the project life cycle. So when you're at a proof of concept phase, the, uh, the whole goal there is to attempt to give the data scientists the data they need in order to do their job. But in order to do that, you need to find it. You know? So it needs to be well catalogued. It needs to be understandable. You need to mine it, which is kind of a, a, a way of, of describing sort of mixing data together in order to produce something useful. You've got access level control um, issues. And, uh, and, and, and finally, that all needs to be locally accessible to the data scientist. When you get into um, MD, uh, you know, some kind of almost production state, then we need to start turning these things into pipelines so that the, the feature engineering that's going on is encoded and is repeatable. Um, We've got schemas that need to be defined, because if you don't have schemas for your data, then it's very hard to test that your data conforms to that schema, so on and so forth. And then finally, in production, you get sort of higher level governance-related issues with regards to your data in terms of you know, monitoring, making sure it's OK, uh, testing, making sure it's good quality, scalable, governable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to come back to that slide a little bit later on because I think Bacalao does map onto some of these requirements, and so I'm going to sort of attempt to do that a little bit later. But for now, I'm going to pass you over to Enrico to talk about. Thank you, Phil. Um, so here's an overview of um, what, um, some of the uh, popular general computing frameworks. Uh, so I just want to uh, run a little test here. Raise your hand if you heard of use any of these tools before. I heard some la good laughs before. Uh, well, that's cool. OK, so just to recap quickly, we have um, you know, Python, uh, PyData Py kind of stack, uh, top right, left corner. We have uh, database um, uh, systems in, in the in top right corner, and, 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 and big data uh, players at the bottom. Uh, let's um, take a look at um, some of these. Um, well, now, so Pandas uh, is yeah is is a Python uh, for data analysis. Uh, it's uh, very popular because it's um, a data frame object. It's a, it's a table you can run uh, lots of uh, interesting data managing on it. Uh, it comes with utilities for uh, managing in, and sampling uh, missing data uh, and so on and so on. Uh, very very versatile syntax. Postgres uh, is essentially a relational database. Um, you can essentially use it in any language. Uh, it comes with lots of adap uh, adapters. Uh, popular syntax is a SQL uh, declarative syntax. Now, uh, these two, um, uh, so when do you want to use uh, the other two uh, players on the list? Dask and Snowflake, essentially when, uh, when your data set uh, doesn't fit in your uh, laptop, you may want to consider um, uh, these other two uh, players, but they're 
uh, Dask and Snowflake are, um, in terms of syntax or uh, approach to data, are quite similar uh, to Pandas and Phosphorus, respectively. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Now, uh, in this example, uh, it's, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's structured tabular data, uh, you know, um, uh, processing. Uh, the idea here is we have a, um, a real estate um, um, housing data set, and we just want to uh, compute average uh, aggregated uh, per zip code, just an example. On the left-hand side, you have uh, a pandas example. So as you can see, data uh, importing a library and, 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 and data uh, parsing and reading is just a, just a matter of one-liner. And uh, processing, that's also very concise. Uh, you do group by, mean, bang, you have your result. Now on Postgres, uh, it's slightly different. You first need to um, uh, create a, a table, which is a way to specify your data schema. And it, it's going to be very strict on that. Um, and, and, and verify your data set complies. Uh, data loading is also uh, fast, and what's also highlighted by the red arrow is, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a SQL query um, uh, to compute that average. Uh, aggregated, quite similar uh, to pandas, uh, I would say. Um, so let's take a look at these. Uh, the, 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 yeah, these two players have been, you know, making history in the big data uh, world. Um, and let's start. Well, Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop is essentially a uh, well a distributed um, a storage system, HDFS. Uh, and it also comes with a computing um, uh, engine that uh, um, uh, implements MapReduce uh, paradigm to uh, processing. It's a mainly Java tool, uh, quite famous uh, for its, its, its very verbose and, and also uh, it has a clumsy API compared to modern tools. Um, it, 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 you know, it scales out um, well, though uh, its um, intermediate uh, processing steps are going to be uh, stored on, on, on disk, and that this, this, this makes uh, the world computing uh, a little bit slow. Spark, uh, its Hadoop successors tried to uh, solve that problem essentially uh, by running in-memory computation, makes it uh, faster. And this is also Scala, Java uh, uh, kind of tool. Um, well, just uh, what, what I want to uh, highlight here, though, is that these tools are uh, production uh, uh, ready, right? So it means they, um, they, they, they provide you stability, uh, high availability, if well configured, uh, and also, um, I'll, I'll show an example later, but uh, they introduce the concept of job and pipeline uh, and uh, some try to have a more declarative um, uh, syntax and, and, and scale out uh, you know, to very, very large uh, data sets. Pandas, that's really hard to operationalize on uh, you know, at the deployment um, uh, phase, very, very good on large laptops. Um, let's take a look at an example of these two. Now, Spark, uh, this is the same uh, um, average house price uh, example uh, in, in um, a show before, and this is in Spark. Uh, that's uh, Scala uh, code. As you see, it's a little bit more uh, verbose than uh, you know, the previous uh, options. And you can already see that essentially you just start, uh, you start by creating some context and, uh, and, and uh, that allows you to um, communicate and connect to your remote cluster. And then uh, there will be a, um, a session setup or uh, where you configure your parameters and uh, maybe you know pass credentials or whatever or um, you, you find in your job there. And then um, Spark also comes with a uh, with a data frame uh, a structure that uh, it somewhat reminds you to. Um, the pandas data, data, uh, data frame. Uh, here uh, you can just chain uh, method calls, group by, average, as I'll add everybody, um, Harrow. Um, this stuff doesn't just run right away. You need to uh, you need a way to package this up, this up uh, into a jar file, which is essentially uh, a package that you can um, that ships uh, your your code and uh, along with uh, required dependencies and so on. 
Um, a possible way to run these is by using uh, SPAR submit CLI, uh, where uh, you, well, in this case, you point it to uh, your cluster, local cluster in the, in the example, can be remote, and uh, you pass along your jar file as well. Um, so these uh, doesn't, uh, so this created, creates a job. Uh, uh, and creates a DAG, and this will be this essentially uh, the first uh, execution at a later stage when the cluster will be able to process that. Uh, and uh, so you can already see it's quite different than uh, the local kind of um, um, setup. And uh, well, so yeah, well, how about Hadoop? Like, um, where does it all fit in uh, in uh, in all these? I say, well, you can really, it's really hard to cage a, a, an elephant. Uh, in fact, as we, we, we said, uh, is, uh, a Hadoop example doesn't even fit on this slide, but let me, I'll show you something later. Um, yeah, well, we don't really see the two axes here, but essentially the two arrows, but we have data scale, scale on the x-axis, and uh, flexibility on the y-axis, and, uh, and also other possible axes. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, there are different ways to look at this landscape analysis. Um, and uh, as we said, uh, it's also, uh, it's really important to, pr to look at production readiness, for example, uh, right? And in that case, you would be looking at the right, uh, right hand uh, side of the screen. Uh, but if we look at uh, essentially trade-off um, between flexibility the tool gives you and data set a scale, uh, we see that like as you grow in a way in the capability of managing lar large data sets, then your flexibility and complexity uh, increases, and and that's definitely that's definitely a hurdle for uh, data practitioners. Yeah, talking about hurdles. Um, so in, in, uh, here um, we have, um, it's kind of intuitive, so simple tools um, uh, have lots of pros. Very, you know, easy to set up and maintain, easy to use, uh, maybe, you know, friendly to your, you know, usual um, tech stack or language, easy to debug. And, and, and here, for instance, uh, when you need to debug a, a dupe job or, uh, or, or PySpark job, uh, you know, that can be you know, very, very painful. Uh, uh, that's not it, though. Uh, there is all, um, you also want to take a look at uh, or consider a community support. Some frameworks are doing very, very good uh, uh, you know, in pushing that. But, However, when it comes to shareability uh, and your capability of like, sharing pipelines, artifacts, uh, and, and, and you know, being declarative in some way, then it's, uh, that's what most you know, frameworks are struggling with. And, uh, in our, and ex another example we, we mentioned before is um, the headache in moving from a local uh, set up uh, to a cluster space um, with, with big data tools. And here is an example. Um, so David showed this before. You have pandas, this runs on your local, all right, very concise syntax, okay. But then you have a dupe on the right hand, um, and, and this, this, this is a map of this job, runs on a, on, a, on a large cluster. Problem is, that's not even the whole thing because um, in, <laughs> there's much more uh, behind that. Well, first of all, you, you're going to need to um, well, connect and test that, uh, that connection to your uh, well distributed storage, uh, uh, and um, there should be arrows uh, pointing at those uh, um, rectangles. But um, you, there's, when you process a large data set, there's always that single data point that's going to a failure execution, uh, right? And so you want to introduce uh, that uh, exception handling code, of course. Maybe add a schema and uh, validation. Um, and at some point, you need to distribute that uh, 
you need uh, you need to allow your uh, cluster nodes to um, uh, take that um, uh, um, uh, take your application and and so so and, and run it. So uh, you may want to uh, package it in a Docker container, distribute that, uh, or maybe push it to a Docker registry. Uh, Di distribute that across your nodes, figure out, uh, you know, authentications and so on. Uh, and then uh, finally, you're able to do your Hadoop submit or Spark submit uh, uh, run. Uh, you'll have to configure uh, uh, resources such as CPU and so on, launch your job, again, install CLI and so on, and then, and then monitor it. And if that fails, if that fails, you'll have to go back to uh, configuration or maybe even coding and, and iterate uh, there. And it's, uh, it, it uh, can be very painful. Is uh, the thing is, it's not a one-man show. You'll probably need a whole team, uh, uh, you know, next to you. Um, well, with, with that, I'll uh, give it back to Phil. Thank you. <coughs> oh, Zappa Rooney. Um, this may be the chair, it's like a static chair, my hair sticking up on end. Um, just, just sort of coming back to some of these ideas as well, I think just trying to sum all of this up. So, so firstly, in order to do data engineering and data science at scale, you, you don't do it yourself. You do it as part of a really big team. It takes a lot of people to make this work. I think that's one sort of big takeaway. Um, another big takeaway is that there is no debuggability in any of these sort of high-level orchestrators. If you want to um, test your data engineering code, you just try it, and you wait until it fails. And when it fails, you then go through the horrible Java stack traces that are 600 lines long, and you figure out which little thing you know to, to caused it to fail. Stack traces, if you're lucky, most of the time <laughs> they uh, fail silently and or like routes your output to some node that you have no idea where it is. That's right, yeah. And even in, in, in Spark, which is somewhat better in terms of adversity and usability and stuff, Spark excels in situations where it's doing like analytics like workloads. And they have put a lot of effort into trying to optimize the performance of SQL-like jobs. Um, and then one of the ways in which they do that is that they dynamically control the scale out, the fan out of the job. So you, you saw the code that we had before. Um, so this, this code here, so this code actually defines the DAG. This defines the pipeline that is going to run in Spark. But you, as a person, you don't really know what that DAG do looks like because Spark doesn't know at this point. It doesn't know until you submit it. Then it figures out how it's going to run it. And that makes memory management incredibly difficult because any one of those steps could be a little bit bigger than 64 gigabytes or however big your node is. And, um, and it'll fail. You know, so it's really hard to do memory management in Spark. It's really hard to figure out what your pipeline and DAG is. Um, it's just all of these things that sort of sound like little nits, but they they add up to just being really painful. Why is my Spark cluster spending eighty percent of its time shuffling data between? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in fact, like um, operating Spark clusters in big is a job now in big companies. There's people at Uber whose entire job is to optimize the Spark cluster. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to sort of come back to this this uh, slide again and just sort of try and place some of these tools into the to the life cycle. And as you can see, that you know when you're you're, you're doing POC, everybody uses pandas. It's, yeah. When you you if you wanted to try and scale that job, then you can use something like Dask, which is pretty it's really nice to use and it does allow you to scale, but it doesn't provide the production level quality, declarativity, monitoring, all of the things that you need to, you know, for, for, for intensive jobs. Uh, and then finally, you, you, on the right-hand side, you get the, 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 the schedulers of the world. Um, and, they're, and, they're, and they're OK, but they're not great. Um, and I think that this is really the, the landscape that we're competing with when we're, we're talking about back, back or how. Um, and um, this is the, uh, these are the things that we want to be comparing ourselves to. So, um, so going back to uh, so what we need from 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 Backlow as an uh, as an ML engineer, then we go back to this picture again, and this is a, you know an arbitrary picture. You speak to another data engineer, they'd, they'd pick another set of of criteria. But I, I thought this was a, a pretty good representation of the of the day to day job. And what I'm proposing is that we could possibly build 
either build back allowed to solve some of these problems or build tools on top of it to solve some of these problems. So, for example, uh, I don't know, let's, let's, let's start from the bottom, like on a, on a data access level, you know, we companies need to have access controls in place to be able to control the use of, of, of data for, for legal reasons, for regulatory reasons, for, for business reasons as well. And they need that data to be exposed in some way, sorry. They uh, need that data to be exposed in a catalog. It needs to be searchable, it needs to be findable, uh, it needs to be observable to the people that need to see it. Um, the data needs to be work, you know, needs to work locally. Um, when it comes to pipelines, we need to be able to, act, like in my, in my opinion, I quite like specifying the DAG myself, actually specifying the pipeline myself, as opposed to letting the tool optimize it for me. Um, and it's only because then, in my head, I've got a mental map of what the DAG is doing, and that helps me debug. You could argue that if you, if, you ha if you provide a better way of doing debugging, then maybe you can allow the framework to control the DAG a bit more, but I don't know. Um, schema, I don't know how you, you'd, you'd handle schema. And um, there's, we, we could talk quite a lot, actually, at length about like what, what could, how could we implement a lot of this. And I, I think basically what I'm saying is that we need to present Bacalao in this way in order to get data scientists on board. We need to be familiar. We need to talk in familiar terms. We can't use the Web3 terms. You can't use the word DHT, which I didn't know until about three hours ago, because I didn't know what that acronym meant. You know, We need to talk in terms of data catalogs, not, not DHTs, and, and so on and so forth. So there's always there's going to be some sort of uh, interface that we're going to have to cross in order to, to talk in their language. Um, and other things that have popped into my head over the day that I find really interesting, we've been talking about verification a lot in the morning. And we we're talking about verification in the sense that we're trying to verify and prove that they did the work that they did. But because ML and pipelining and data is so uncertain in the first place, most of the time, I'm not going to get attacked. It's not going to be this, it's not going to be this guy that's pretending to do work, and that's going to cause my things to error. It's going to be my fault that the things have errored. The, the data is crap, and I haven't checked it, and I haven't cleaned it properly, or my ML model is going to diverge, and it doesn't actually learn. So I started to think about whether we could actually use the verification interface as a part of like a part of the testing and quality element of the lifecycle and the monitoring as well. So, like, if you're, you know, in your little table that you showed, like, if that little, if, if we had a little cross when my model diverged, I ended up with a complete, you know, nonsense model. Uh, things like that. Then we've got sort of governance. Um, a, a big thing that I'm a big advocate of is, uh, is lineage in data science and provenance. And the idea there is that <clears throat> it's really important to know how your models were built and where those, middle, those models were built from. You need to know that this particular artifact was trained on that data. Um, so, to, to, yeah, to, we've been doing some work with, um, with Ofcom, um, a, a UK regulator, that's about to start regulating social media platforms to prevent online harm. And uh, part of their remit is that they need to be able to, uh, well, they want the platforms to be able to demonstrate that whenever they serve some, some, some content to some users, they, they don't want people to come to harm because of that content. And so if a regulator comes into that business, they, they're going to want to know, you know, what model was running at that time, and what data was that model trained upon. The vast majority of businesses that we've spoken to, even really big ones, are, they, they can't do that. They can't do that because they don't know how to do it, or they can't do it because they haven't got anything in place. So anyway, so I think that there's a, a big gap in the lineage market that I think we could also tackle basically chaining data together to like verifiably prove that this data set or originated from that other data set. So that's kind of a, like a feature map. Like this is this is what you need to try and provide on a feature basis. Um, but there's all the, the, there's, there's, there's then sort of other dimensions that fit on top of that. Like in terms of how well you do that. The first one is familiarity and ease of use. It's the UX. We've been talking about that a lot already. Flexibility. Um, this is a big one. So Spark and Hadoop are very locked down in terms of what you can use and what you can do. Um, trying to keep it as flexible as possible to allow the data scientists to use, uh, the data engineers to use whatever libraries they want to use. That'd be great. Scalability, that's when people talk about production ready, they're usually saying scalability, it needs to scale. Um, declara yeah, de declarativity, and that's how well the, the lineage and, and, and provenance and, and, and declaring your pipelines up front. And uh, yeah, production readiness, of course. 
So, I mean, that's it from like a data engineering point of view, but I did want to touch on the ML side as well, because everyone, I think everyone talks about like training ML as this big single step thing, and people have been talking about it in the sense that we want to distribute our ML training. We just want to submit this one job that scales over massive numbers of nodes in order for, for performance reasons or something like that. But we've, we've been talking to more and more people that are having to have local models in locations, in localities, specific models for specific localities. And it's because of different languages, of different cultures, of different you know, things that are deemed harmful and things like that. So some of the, 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 the larger ML companies and tech companies out there, they're not just running one model for one thing. They're running hundreds of models for one thing. And all of those models are completely different. So there's, a, there's an idea here that, that, that locality is important and that where the data resides is important because that specific model for that specific locality is based upon that specific data. The data doesn't need to go to a central location to actually do that training. Because generally, the models that they use in these situations, the model architecture and the model definition is the same. It's just the data that's changing. So I can imagine a situation in a world where you, know, you have this like distributed in the sense of many models, just all trained on different data, all the way down to like local level, like you've got data in your home and you're training models for your specific needs in your own home. Um, that's certainly not possible at the moment, so bear that in mind. And there's, there's a corollary there with, with business processes as well. And when, and when we talk about business processes, you know, they always follow this kind of plot where you're talking about the brewing process. And it's just another process. But businesses have processes like this everywhere. And we've worked with a, a client um, at the moment who is trying to fully automate the paper manufacturer. So they're trying to automate going from wood pulp to bleached white paper. And it looks very much like this. They've got lots of tanks, they've got lots of steps, and they have lots of models all packed powering each of those tanks. But again, the data is local to that one specific phase. The data is local to that one silo within the business. And it doesn't exist anywhere else. It doesn't need to exist anywhere else. So if we can have a, you know, a distributed training for distributed data, um, that's really cool. And, and just to demonstrate that, you know, that real home life brewer, I'm a, I'm a big home brewer, and this is, this is my cooling stage. I've just got a copper pipe that just cools it down. That's what home brewer, and this is my bottling stage here. This is my packaging stage. Um, so that's what it looks like in real life, yeah. Are you, are you happy or worried? A bit of both, a bit of both. Because it is homebrew, any of those bottles could explode at any time. So it's a bit dangerous to open that safety door. OK, so yeah, the future. We've talked about you know, IPFS, IP, what did you call it, Luke? CS? IPCS. IPCS. I'm going for IPAI. And, and, and it was totally accidental that the IPA and the beer thing all came together as well. But I'm going to take it. Yeah. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.